We can start here. So I was not sure how to celebrate. Uh, it was like 10 years ago, September 2011, when I started Filmwax Radio in that little um, storage container <laughs> downtown Brooklyn. Right. Remember, remember? Yeah, the storage container place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, remember the uh, the Cal Market, which was then became yeah. City just... Point, now Mall. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. So, and um, it's weird. Not, I actually you know, have never stepped foot in City Point Mall. Uh, although I did, I, I've been in um, that other one, the really luxury one a couple of times, just because I think it's so fascinating. Where, what do you mean? It, uh, the Hudson Yards. Oh, the Hudson Yard. Okay. Yeah. Well, City Point there, okay. has the Alamo Draft House <laughs> on the top floor. Yeah. So. I, yeah. I, that was, it's kind of after I moved, right. but I did do a lot of shooting in um, Fulton Mall. I was trying to document that before it was gone. Exactly. So we, you know, this ties directly. It's interesting because that neighborhood is more in Kelly's film. Right. But yeah. it has so much to do with Battle for Brooklyn. So, and yeah. I just, I just, I, you know, I hark, it, it, it all makes me think of that period back when we mm -hmm. first met. And um, it was so, it was, it was so much a part of our lives. <laughs> well, for you and Suki and. Uh, right. Um, well, just that like, yeah, you know, the ba Battle for Brooklyn was really a canary in the coal mine of um, kind of a, just a government d decision oh, right. to For change the, the shape. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, the canary in the coal, like it, it was kind of a precursor. Like I remember the way we started that movie was, you know, our, our daughter went to Prospect Heights Daycare, which was up on Dean and, um, or no, it was on Underhill and, um, okay. and Vanderbilt. And so- um, I saw, I didn't even actually see the article in the paper, but I saw, I started seeing signs saying, stop the project. And I was like, what's this project? Oh, no, no. Actually, I, let me start over. Actually, I remember reading the article in the paper saying, you know, this um, garden of Eden grows in Brooklyn. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. What? Wait, there, there, people live there. What are they talking about? You know? Yeah, right. And so I, I started asking my neighbors and they're like, listen, the governor, the mayor, everyone's for it. It's going to happen. I was like, but it sounds ridiculous. And then I saw Patty Hagen's sign saying, stop Patty. the project. So I called her up and I started filming. And it was so interesting because I knew that people lived there because we were there every day. And, um, and I didn't know how far it was going to extend. That was like a couple blocks outside the project, but it was still there. And I was working with Patty li literally every day. I was walking around the snow and the ice. And she's bringing all these media people around and explaining what was going on, which is how I was becoming familiar with it. And then she said, you know, there's one guy, there's one of these loft dwellers who's going to stick it out, I think. Everyone else is just going to sell out because they don't care, but he cares and he's going to fight this project. And, he, and I was like, oh, well, what's his name? She said, you know, yeah, Daniel Goldstein. I was like, oh, I know Dan. He like designed the, I didn't know him. I lived in Maine with him for a summer for a few weeks. And he was, this is, gets even weirder. He was, um, roommates with a good friend of mine from high school whose daughter is at Barnard and who I ran into when he was dropping her off the other day. So it's just incredible how the world kind of these, these little, these little intersections yeah. happen throughout our lives. And that's actually one of the biggest lessons I'm trying to tell my daughter when I drop her off for college is don't shit where you eat because you, all these people that you're meeting now are going right. to have well, an impact what, on yeah. your lives. Well, it's yeah. the same, you know, it's the same kind of a, a close relationship of, you know, be careful who you, how you uh, interact with people on your way up the ladder. You know, it's the same kind of like treat people well. And, and also, you know, but it's a, yeah, but, relate yeah. relationships and, and uh, 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 situations are on some level evergreen. And, you know, you, I, you know, whether or not you ever meet somebody again, I, or they have any influence in your life in the future, it's always just best to be as, as cool as you can be, I think. And yeah, but also just not be judgmental because everybody's going through something. And True. while someone may annoy you in the moment, you can go, oh yeah, that's really about them. It's not about me. And I, I could be in the space of that person. The, the point being is if you just are thoughtful, um, you'll make a lot of friends and very few enemies. Um, speaking of which... <laughs> Our friend at the time of Battle for Brooklyn, and we ended up doing, I think, I, I didn't do, the, I didn't crunch the numbers before we just got on, but I think we had to have done 
Phil Max and you, Rumor mm-hmm. had to have done probably in partnership some like three or four screenings of Battle for Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, I remember the, the Brooklyn Heights when you did a retro <laughs> of, of all your films and uh, I kind of yeah. was involved in some of that. And then, the, but there was, of course, the rough cut at, you know, on, in Park Slope that it, going even before the film was done. Uh, yeah. And then the big one, which I'm the most, I'm the most proud of and have the p- most positive feelings was, was Brooklyn reconstructed at the ethical society. Remember that? That, whole I do. that was a really uh, beautiful thing. Yeah. I, I, and it I was, a real, it was the, were really great conversations. That's right. These films I, were a catalyst. That was sort of the idea, you know, like I was catching on when I was doing the film series on Fifth Avenue and Park Slope, I was realizing this is really about talk, you know, like connecting with people and the films are just a kind of catalyst for the conversations. Right. Yeah. And, and, and it, and it kind of, it's interesting because it was an early podcast, but, you know, podcasts have become a way, especially throughout this um, pandemic, a way for people to connect. Mm. You know, and stay connect within some kind of types of communities, right? In the same way that you were trying to do, you were helping to create a more um, inclusive and connected uh, film community, making it people feel m- much more like they had access to what was going on in a real conversational way, rather than here, let me sell you my project. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was kind of a, it was partly promotion, but also more connectivity i wish i had been only thing is i kind of wish i had been even better at kind of just promoting at the time because i mean i think that what we were doing was you know could have been part of the whole movement against the complete you know decimation of brooklyn's character and and community uh i mean it's not all gone well it, instead it but, became more of a, a documentation of something that it becomes yeah. inevitable and, and unchangeable yeah and it it's all through that yeah, yeah. it's it's, it's more historical yeah. Yeah. yeah it's more historical than advocacy and i think i think advocacy has a place in the world but I, unfortunately i feel like advocacy has become more um warlike rather than resolution like Mm -hmm. with good reason because there's so many terrible things going on and those with power will extend that power but i think you know i mean because this brings up another point part of like say battle for brooklyn was and it extended after that like especially with occupy a, a real rethought about like what what is the purpose of documentary and so i kind of i came to it making documentaries or making films at all with a background, like I went to school and I got a, uh, in college, I was a religious studies major. And it wasn't Mm -hmm. because I was really interested in religion. It's because by the time it was time to declare a major, I had completed the major because I took a lot of anthropology classes and sociology classes. And those things had an impact on my understanding of what a documentary was, or even from an anthropological uh, perspective. So like when I did the mall project, I was, I mean, I hated the mall and I didn't really like people in the mall, but I understood that in order to, to make work that was relevant, it shouldn't be about what my opinions were as much as about really document, capturing what the essence was, you know? Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I found that essence rare, um, but, um, and, and I think that that's important. I, I still think that's important. Uh, and then, you know, later after having, we made Half Cocked, it, which is our first film, which was kind of like a hybrid mumblecore documentary, right? It's documenting something, but also writing something because we didn't have enough money to shoot that much film. And I was under the impression from what I knew about documentary that I really wasn't in the position to make a documentary because I was too much a part of that community. And mm-hmm. I didn't have critical distance you know, which is kind of like a colonial idea of how you do documentary or how you do anthropology. And, you know, these things just kind of weave their way into the fabric. And so by the time Occupy came around, I was, I was drawn down there by all the advocacy work that was being made. Um, And I, and I saw the media that was being made like the, and it was, there was such a gulf between the two. And I felt like, okay, just from What's what becomes valuable, and this actually comes back to, to film wax. What makes film wax really valuable is it's this kind of really in between, just a real settled look and, and discussion, which maybe isn't as 
flashy or exciting in the moment, but has so much more weight and value for those looking back and trying to understand what was going on there. Because mm-hmm. it's not so shaped, it, it just is. And it becomes a really valuable document for any historian. And so that was the idea I was trying to shoot at Occupy. Um, not that occupy, uh, advocacy is wrong, but advocacy is essentially propaganda. And mm-hmm. I have a problem with propaganda mm-hmm. because what it does is it creates division in, in, in its essence, even though it's not its intention, in its essence, it basically creates this limiting effect that we're now seeing writ large, where we just have people who becomes on one side or the other, and there's so little room for any real discussion or empathy, and that's the problem. So if we otherize, I mean, so advocacy is a reaction in some way to colonial views of documentary, but then what happens is you have this, uh, this othering effect where anybody who doesn't already agree with you is the other, and they, you're not even considering what they might think because they're not even worth reaching because they're lost. Yeah. Is it your sense also that we're, we're sort of at the post-advocacy uh, period of, of documentary filmmaking at this point? Because it seemed like oh, no. up through five years. I don't years. think so at all. I think it's, it, that's, it's doubled down on advocacy, advocacy. It's just, it's, it's, um, it's just not even, it's more like just news programming almost because it's not, or info, you know, like infotainment in the sense that there's, it's not even trying to entertain a role at all anymore if it if it exists i don't really i guess I, i'm not watching that much of those anymore yeah i don't know I, I get, well it's interesting it's like those are the ones that are getting there's a certain thing yeah it's also kind of more hidden and, and woven in now it? so it's it, it's became it, i think what it is is it's trying to be like it's not advocacy because it that that has a an effect of pushing away but it's still so woven into it that mm-hmm. it uh it, it's, yeah, I like, I just want nothing to do with documentary, honestly. Um, speaking of um, the, the Battle for Brooklyn days, and, you know, we, it's almost, I'm just grateful for the fact that, you know, PS11, which was our kids' grade school, and um, right. the fact that for somehow or other, you and I, our families ended up sharing a nanny. Yeah. Uh, but, and then that led to Battle for Brooklyn, or it might, you know, might becoming uh, friends with right, you yeah. and Suki yeah. and, and 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 all that. I'm very grateful for it, and because it it really, I evolved, you know, through that period yeah. so much, and I so I thank you for that. Um, yeah. I'm gonna get teary in a minute, but <laughs> uh, well, no, I mean, I, I just want to jump in and say, I mean, I think that's, you know, it was a bit of, um, it was difficult in some ways to to start going to that to that school because everyone else that we knew was going oh that's not you know you're never going to get into a good middle school you got to leave the neighborhood blah 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 and i and i found that problematic but but the truth is right you know we learned way more than our our children did at that school oh that's and good and learned more about the world and um and, and kind of the realities that are unfolding now so none of none of what's unfolding is surprising um you know, because of that. So I, I'm, I, I'm super grateful that whole experience. I had just been one and one other eye opener for me, though, leading up, you know, leading up to Battle for Brooklyn was when I was married to Karen, we actually had lived in this apartment, which was a former or a transitioning uh, a project on uh, Upper Fifth Avenue by the top of Central Park. And there were these two, it's an interesting, it was an interesting uh, sample of social sociology sample because right, right. there were these kind of two communities in one at this building. It was a building that was in definitely in transition because there were these existing families that had been there for 30, 40, 50 years in these apartments, right. primarily African-American or people of color. And then there was an, in the last 10 years before we got there, there's, they started selling apartments at market value, you know? as mm-hmm. families for one reason or another were leaving the building. Right. Um, and Karen and I were one of those families that had moved in and this would have been right as we got married. So we're talking about 19, uh, 2001, 2000, 2001, we bought that apartment. And what I went, what I, I just, it was like for me, a, a really eye-opening 
um, uh, and, and it was an opportunity for me to evolve and to start to really understand what was going on in the city mm -hmm. um, and, and how to be at one point a sort of a gentrifier, but also at the other point, very uh, respectful. And to put it in context, like there is gentrification that's organic. I, I always talk about this, but that, that there's a natural thing that occurs in cities. And then there's what happened with downtown Brooklyn with, right. with, with the Prospect Heights, Fort Greene area where the arena went up, which was not right. in any way. That was all planned out. That's why you mentioned the words fait accompli. It, yeah. You know, this was going to happen. There was a title change coming to Brooklyn. It's, it's you know, I don't know if it's still going on, but it was, um, I guess I was already kind of starting to really be aware of, of what was going on. But, but that, that, right. that project, your film, and, and to some degree, the other films really were quite the, you know, master's degree for me, you know, mm. I really, yeah. So I, 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 I yeah. really changed the way I approached doing film acts, which was in its birth, you know, it was still, right, right. I wasn't even doing the podcast when I met you. Uh, it yeah. just kind of started, but, um, and then we met, and then, and, and, and another amazing thing was the, developing this friendship with Tish James at the time. You guys, of course, had a much more, I barely knew her, but she came to the, we did, I guess, a screening at PS11 too, which. PS11, yeah. That was, you know, we're trying to do something there uh, for fundraising for the school. And she came to that. And then she came to the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Reconstructed Conversation. Right. Which were, again, really amazing. Um, well, and, and now she's. You know, it's interesting, like, yeah. She's a politician, right? Uh, uh, and a very masterful politician. Very masterful, it turns out. But at the end of the day, like all, what I remember more than anything else was, is these endless meetings, right? Um, they would just go on and on and on and on and, and very little was getting done. Right. And I remember coming home from one at 1130, just exhausted from shooting for five hours and starving. So I go across the street to a terrible Chinese place on the corner of Myrtle and Hall. And I order, I think, just literally fried rice. Make it quick, you know? Yeah, sure, sure. Done. It's an emergency. She comes in. Well, she comes in after me to get food. <laughs> and I was just like, this is a person who really is just working endlessly hard. And, of course, is going to have to make some compromises at some point Clearly, that will piss right. off everybody. Right. And at that point, had really pissed off most of her constituency who had been swayed by the propaganda of Ratner that there was going to be these jobs in this housing. But she's looking and going, no, it's not true. And she, but she was having to kind of fight with the people in her community who had, who had bought the cool and who had, who were being paid by Ratner. Right. And I just, I like, I have undying respect for her after all through, I mean, we filmed for seven or eight years and through that process, I saw that what she had to put up with in terms of what was coming at her to attack her, to attack her and how she just, uh, yeah, I just really, she's a really powerfully um, righteous person. I, I believe it, even if she makes certain compromises and even if she does things politically, I think she's not self-interested. I think she really is. She has a deeper interest in, in, it, well, she sees the bigger picture, finding and, a path. you know, you have to, yeah, yeah. there's no way in a, New York city, you're not going to compromise um, right, because because the democratic the machine next, is a machine. To get to the next right. level, she'll be yeah. she'll probably be, uh, you know, a mayor or governor. Um, you know, in in the not too long, or or maybe even a national, you yeah. know, politician at some point soon. I mean, it's there's no doubt because she's. But but saying what I'm saying is seeing how the meat was made. Mm -hmm. I, I still have respect for her. Whereas De Blasio, yeah. I could have told you from the beginning, was an absolute piece of shit because people were coming to him saying, hey, did you read this community benefits agreement? He goes, yeah, I looked at it. He goes, you know, and, and he's trying to talk to him. This is his constituent saying, do you see that there's no teeth in it? There's no, he's like, oh, it's going to work out. And nothing in the community benefit agreement was actually held to. And, and right then you knew that he was in the, he just wasn't a good, good person or a good politician. That he didn't really have the interest in the people in mind. He was more in line with power than with the people. And, and I think you have to respect what power is doing, as Tish did, but it, you have to try and work with power, but you can't give over your power to power, which is what Bill de Blasio did from the very beginning. What do you think? Do you think this is sort of the end of the road? He's just going to become like either a uh, 
corporate lawyer or policy or a lobbyist or we think he's reached the end of the I mean I don't know where he's I don't know I, I since where I does moved, he go now because he's already lost his other bids right so I don't know I don't think he I mean probably he'll yeah, do some kind of lobbying work or probably whatever but I you know I left New York eight, eight years ago so I was um free of his reign you know I didn't really see it gotcha well but anyway. but but the, but the but the difference between the two of them in that mm -hmm. process was mm -hmm. striking and they were both people who represented that community mm. that was going to be affected by the project was he the mayor though when did no he, he was the city he was the the park slope um city council person oh very good okay yeah okay it was him and brad lander and um tish i see okay um daniel goldstein ended up leaving New York. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Michael Galinsky and Suki Holly ended up leaving New York. Yeah. I ended up leaving New York. <laughs> yeah, well. Oh, he's the last old. Uh, there, there's things I, I love about, like I said, I, I, you know, I moved here eight years ago and it wasn't just because of all that. It was also like, I'd been in New York for 30 years. My mom was um, moving out of the house I grew up into. And I felt right. like I really needed to be near her. I'm glad and, you did. I think you did maybe yeah. such a good choice. Well, and Fiona was also having a lot of anxiety in the city. Um, yeah. You know, and I, and I, the first year was hard for me to be out of the city, but I was back every month. And then I didn't, I wasn't there for the whole summer. And I came back in the fall and I remember walking up the subway stairs at uh, getting on the seven train from LaGuardia and just thinking, how the fuck do people live here? <laughs> Because, you know, just living more in the country, you, your body and your brain readjust. They do. I know. I have. And it has become too much to me. So, I do have that experience. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not the only one because uh, I was like, how is it? I lived in the city for 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> and now I feel like, how do people do this? Like, you're a New Yorker, Shark. Anyway. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we're still doing this and we're still friends and, um, you know, uh, I just thought this would be a cool thing to do, maybe to um, reach out to some of the, the first guests yeah. know, that were sitting with me in that storage container 10 years ago this month. Wow, right. Seems. And um, yeah, and we met 15 years ago. Really? When Harper was a baby. Because Harper was, was, was uh, is now Helen's. 15. Yeah. And she's, how's she doing? Harper, she's it's you know it's hard. Yeah, she doesn't uh, she doesn't like the school thing right now either. Yeah. She'd rather sit in her bed and do school at this point. Sure, I get it. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, for, thanks for catching up with me. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I'm trying to think of any last thought that helps tie it all together, but. <laughs> You know, I would Please say tie it all together for me. <laughs> well, I will. I mean, I th I think you know, I think it's really interesting to look back on ten years because you know, the ten years that we're talking about from when you started the podcast is um, is a time of just dramatic change in New York, and it's a, a a time that I kind of missed. I like I just came back to New York to drop off my daughter, and I I'm just consistently shocked. At the transformation, especially in Brooklyn um, or the Hudson Yards as well. I mean, I came out of BH photo the other day and I was like, what the fuck is that building? Because it was a parking yeah. lot and now it's like a 175 story building across the street. And it's just that. And so, uh, but the whole world has changed even in terms of media, in terms of uh, social media. race awareness, social right. media. Um, right. and, and, you know, in this 10 years that we're talking about, it was like um, that that also involves uh, Occupy, Trump, um, and where we're at. And so, you know, social media is both, it, it cleaves us, right? It both brings us together and cuts us apart. And so I wonder where we're headed with all of that. I don't know what's gonna happen. Um, but I believe in the Hegelian dialect, right? I believe that we, we are at this real terrible low point. And what will happen is there will be some kind of coming together. And, and in fact, you know, the, with the floods in New York, there's that, that awareness is really there, you know, um, that 
something has to change, you know, in terms of how we're going to deal with this climate. So we may have some drastic changes, um, um, you know, taking place. It's interesting. Like, I don't even know if you and I have discussed this, but um, the documentary we started even before we finished Battle for Brooklyn was one about uh, the fact that I was a sperm donor. And recently um, I met a daughter um, who is now one of my best friends and her name is Holly and she was getting her PhD in climate communication and she just got it. So it's such an uh, incredible moment for her because she's gonna be at the forefront of how we're gonna help shift this world. And so something like what just happened is actually probably really um, exciting. And, and, and actually it's interesting because she lives in, near Rutgers and Rutgers mm -hmm. is underwater. I mean, the highway. You know, yeah. yeah, I mean, the, like central route, areas like where you, one yeah. yeah, yeah, we're one heading towards, um, you know, there's little signs for the Jersey Turnpike just above the water line. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, there's a, it, it's yeah. crazy. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess all of these things are super connected. Oh, but this is what I was going to say is part yeah. of her discussion. I watched her PhD defense and what uh, the real takeaway from it was like, all the all the work that you do to change people's behavior around climate doesn't even touch people who are living in poverty because they just yeah. don't have the bandwidth to make any changes. Not. So the takeaway from it is that UBI is probably the the greatest tool we have in terms of dealing with climate change because it's going to make it possible for the greatest number of people to help make them make the shifts that they need to as well. So it's got to come all these different levels, but it's also probably universal health care and UBI will yeah, solve most of the social income. ills that we have. Yeah. 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 Universal basic income and universal health care um, may be expensive, uh, but they're probably the only way out of this. That's right. Um, There's, well, I think yeah, homelessness and, and, and uh, joblessness is far more expensive um, on, on government uh, than that. Yeah than the alternatives that you mentioned. And so it's, it's, and it seems inevitable. And I'll tell you, if, if, if we're going through another surge, I, I just honestly don't see how there's any, <laughs> you can have a revolution. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, there's going to be way too many people without jobs. And um, uh, yeah, so it's a time just to get real practical. Yeah, and I guess kind of the idea of the American individualism is really right. what's going on right now. Like of people are trying course, to hold on to something. Joke. Yeah, right. Yeah, but it doesn't. It's not. I mean, yeah. That was never a thing. Yeah, I mean, it could be if we had a different tax policy, but it's not. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Awesome. All right. Well, it's good catching up. All right. Well, we'll 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 do this again when with the next project for sure. But in the meantime, yeah. it's good to see you. You too. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Yeah.